Welcome. My name is Dr. Peter Schnatz, and it is a pleasure to welcome you today to our International Menopause Society Symposium on Osteoporosis, titled Osteoporosis for Midlife Women and Beyond. You're in for a, a wonderful treat today, and I believe uh, quite a uh, powerful uh, presentation with two wonderful colleagues, uh, individuals that I've had the pleasure of getting to know over a number of years. Uh, and before I introduce both of our presenters, I just want to remind everybody that uh, this webinar today has been supported by an unrestricted educational grant from Basing Healthcare. Basing's Healthcare has no role in the selection of topics, selection of speakers, and have not vetted, reviewed the content of the speakers' presentations. Again, our Topic and title is Osteoporosis for Midlife Women and Beyond, and our two presenters today will be Dr. Michael Lewicki and Dr. Michael McClung. Dr. Michael Lewicki will present first. His topic will be a review of the current guidelines on the diagnosis and when to treat in the osteoporosis patient. Dr. Lewicki is the director of the New Mexico Clinical Research and Osteoporosis Center and Director of Bone Health Tel-Echo at the University of New Mexico Health Sciences Center in Albuquerque, New Mexico. He's a consultant in osteoporosis and metabolic bone disease, supervisor and interpreter of bone density studies, and an educator with special interest in the evaluation and treatment of osteoporosis and metabolic bone diseases. He's been the principal investigator for many osteoporosis clinical trials, and is an author of over 300 publications in peer-reviewed medical journals, as well as books, book chapters, and online publications in osteoporosis. Dr. Lewicki is the program director of the annual Santa Fe Bone Symposium, the flagship activity of the OFNM. He's a past president of the International Society for Clinical Densitometry and founding president of the Osteoporosis Foundation of New Mexico. He's an editor for Osteoporosis International and is on the editorial boards of the Journal of Bone and Mineral Research and the Journal of Clinical Densitometry and has received national and international awards that include the 2021 John Belzikian Global Leadership Award and the 2021 Lawrence Wrights Memorial Lecture Award with the Bone Health and Osteoporosis Foundation. Our second presentation by Dr. Michael McClung will be the current and best therapeutic options. Dr. McClung is an endocrinologist with special interest in metabolic bone diseases and disorders of calcium metabolism. And as the founding and now emeritus director of the Oregon Osteoporosis Center in Portland, Dr. McClung has for the past four decades cared for patients with osteoporosis and related conditions. He developed quality control procedures for bone density testing has been involved in many major clinical trials of osteoporosis treatment and has participated in the development of osteoporosis guidelines for several national and international organizations, including the International Menopause Society, as well as the North American Menopause Society. He's an author of many peer-reviewed manuscripts and invited papers and currently serves on the boards of the International Osteoporosis Foundation and NAMS and on editorial boards of a number of journals related to metabolic bone diseases. He's currently a professorial fellow at the Mary McKillop Center of Health Research at the Australian Catholic University in Melbourne and has received teaching awards from several societies and is frequently invited as a speaker teacher at national and international clinical conferences. Without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Professor Lewicki for our per first presentation on reviewing of the current guidelines on diagnosis and when to treat. Well, thank you, Peter, for the kind uh, introduction. I'm going to talk about guidelines on the diagnosis and indications for treatment. Uh, here is my disclosure. Um, perhaps uh, the most relevant is that uh, I've been involved in guideline development for um, a number of organizations that you see here. So if uh, perhaps you don't uh, uh, like some of the things in the guidelines, I'm probably at least partially to blame. Uh, here are my objectives. I'm going to discuss current standards for diagnosing osteoporosis. 
review medications and conditions with harmful skeletal effects and present recommendations for initiating pharmacological therapy for prevention and for treatment of osteoporosis. And then uh, Mike McClung will go on to talk about specific therapeutic agents. When we're talking about the guidelines and recommendations and data from clinical trials, uh, we don't want to lose sight that uh, uh, medicine is all about people and osteoporosis is about uh, people breaking bones. And uh, it, it can affect all of us personally. Uh, this is a photo from my family album. This is uh, Aunt Edna. This is the same woman in both of these photographs. Uh, uh, on the left, you see her in her 50s. She's a fine, uh, uh, straight standing woman who's vigorous and active. And uh, on the right, you see Aunt Edna in her 70s um, when she suffered from severe postmenopausal osteoporosis with multiple vertebral fractures. Uh, in those days, when Aunt Edna was around, we didn't uh, have any good treatments for osteoporosis other than estrogen, and she did not take estrogen because she was not having hot flashes. And she died shortly after that second photo was taken. So I, I think the goal for uh, all of us is that uh, uh, none of us uh, in the future have people like Aunt Edna in their photo albums that are patients don't wind up like Aunt Edna, and that we ourselves uh, don't end up having uh, fractures that might have been prevented. And what Aunt Edna had is a, a preventable disease, and, and this could have been uh, treated uh, with medications that we currently have. Uh, we do have a, a lot of guidelines. Uh, I'd venture to say too many of them. Uh, on the left, you see just a, a few of the more current uh, guidelines, uh, the Bone Health and Osteoporosis Foundation, formerly the National Osteoporosis Foundation of the U.S., uh, just released uh, guidelines uh, this year. It's uh, available as an EPUB, uh, American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists, Endocrinologists, uh, Endocrine Society, and NAMS. Uh, and I'm going to focus uh, today on uh, NAMS uh, guidelines uh, because they're very recent and it comes from an organization that has a very strong interest in uh, a broad range of menopausal uh, issues. The ISCD uh, has guidelines that are mostly focused on diagnosis and quality standards for bone density testing. And in an effort towards harmonization of guidelines, uh, the National Osteoporosis Foundation in the US, Osteoporosis Canada, and the National Academy in Mexico, uh, not too long ago, uh, published a paper taking a, fall, a small first step uh, toward harmonizing uh, guidelines. And uh, hopefully these organizations will get together uh, in the future and take some additional steps uh, towards uh, greater standardization of get guidelines. Uh, on the right uh, panel, you see some of the differences of guidelines. Um, sometimes they address different patient populations, sometimes women only, sometimes men only, sometimes both, glucocorticoid-induced osteoporosis sometimes. Uh, they may have different treatment uh, goals. So, some are focused on preventing fractures, others are focused on uh, preventing uh, osteoporosis from developing in the first place. Uh, they're directed to different audiences with different specialties sometimes. Uh, some are applicable to specific countries and regions. There's different methods of uh, development, uh, some of which uh, depend more or less on expert opinion. And they go by different names, which uh, may imply subtle differences in, in the goals. Some are called guides, some guidelines, some position statements, official positions, or uh, consensus. So we'll go on to talk about the NAMS uh, guidelines. Uh, it's my feeling that uh, all guidelines are actually wrong uh, in the sense that uh, you can find many, many exceptions to the guidelines in taking care of uh, individual patients that don't seem to uh, 
fit well with uh, how the guidelines are going. But good ones are useful, I think, because they provide a framework for making uh, clinical decisions. And somewhere in almost all guidelines, uh, usually buried uh, towards the end of the publication, there's a statement that says something like, treatment decisions should be individualized. And I think that's the bottom line and maybe the most important thing about all guidelines. We need to consider the guidelines if they're appropriate, but we have to take care of an individual patient sitting across from us in a room who may have very specific uh, issues. So here is a, a postmenopausal woman. Uh, let's uh, imagine she's had a recent fracture. And these are some of the, the, the things that come up in the course of a conversation. She might tell me anyone would have broken a bone if they fell this hard. Uh, no one in my family has osteoporosis. I only want natural treatment. Why do I need a drug? What are the side effects? Don't these drugs cause brittle bones and rotten jaw? How long do I have to take it? What is the cause? And many more questions. And this can take a, a long conversation sometimes. And sometimes we don't have enough time to cover all of this. And uh, these are the sorts of questions we can cover in the Q&A if, uh, if there's interest in doing that. So what do we do with this patient? Well, first, we want to uh, evaluate fracture risk with the tools that we have available, such as bone density testing and fracture risk algorithms and past medical history. We want to determine whether fracture risk is uh, high enough that pharmacological therapy is indicated. Uh, then we need to evaluate the patient for factors contributing to skeletal fragility and have a discussion about these results with the patient. Then we have to select an individual uh, therapeutic agent that we think is the best for starting therapy. And finally, we have to follow up uh, to be sure that the patient takes the treatment uh, correctly and long enough in order to benefit from uh, the, the goals uh, of our treatment. So I'm going to focus on the first part of this. Uh, Mike McClung will uh, uh, focus on treatment. So I'll talk about fracture risk assessment, intervention thresholds, and evaluation and discussion. These are the indications uh, from the NAMS uh, guidelines for uh, bone density testing. Um, and this uh, is applicable to postmenopausal women. So age 65 and older uh, should have a bone density test. Women age 50 to 65 with at least one of the following risk factors uh, should uh, have a bone density test. Uh, if there's been a fracture since uh, menopause, uh, if there's a, a known medical cause of bone loss or fracture, plus uh, vertebral imaging should be done in women uh, age 70 and older who have had historical height loss of greater than 1.5 uh, inches. Uh, and what you see on the image to the right is a wall-mounted stadiometer. So um, if you're interested in accurately determining whether a woman has had a loss of height, this is the way to do it, rather than a, a floppy arm that uh, comes out from a standard uh, office scale. And some of these stadiometers can measure height with an accuracy of uh, just one half of one millimeter. And historical uh, loss of height uh, is uh, uh, a trigger for doing vertebral imaging because uh, these patients are at higher than average risk for having uh, unrecognized vertebral fractures and identification of a previously unrecognized vertebral fracture may change diagnostic classification, might change your assessment of fracture risk, and it might change your decision to treat uh, or how to treat. These are the World Health Organization diagnostic criteria according to DEXA. Normal is a T-score minus 1.0 or greater. Osteopenia, also called low bone mass, is T-score between minus 1 and minus 2.5. Osteoporosis is less than or equal to minus 2.5. And severe, 
osteoporosis, also called established osteoporosis, means a T-score in the osteoporosis range and uh, the presence of a fragility fracture. Uh, T-scores, however, uh, don't tell us the whole uh, story. Uh, a T-score that's minus 2.5 and below is not always osteoporosis. For example, it uh, could be osteomalacia, uh, a disorder of bone mineralization. It could be osteogenesis imperfecta, uh, which means abnormal bone uh, collagen. Um, T-score greater than minus 2.5 may be osteoporosis. For example, uh, when a fracture has occurred, um, most guidelines will say that you can make a diagnosis of osteoporosis independently of bone density. And at least in the US, uh, we can make a diagnosis of osteoporosis in some cases when there's a high fracture probability by FRAX, even though T-score is greater than minus 2.5. Keep in mind that T scores apply to postmenopausal women uh, and perimenopausal women, uh, as well as men age 50 and older. And then younger women, men and children, uh, we use Z scores, not to T scores. And the WHO diagnostic criteria do not apply in this case. A T score may change when bone mineral density does not. So when we're doing quantitative comparisons with DEXA, we always want to compare BMD in gram per centimeter squares and not T scores. And the reason is uh, that uh, the software in the DEXA systems may use different uh, reference databases, uh, which may change from time to time. Uh, altering the T-score when in some cases the, the bone mineral density may actually not be significantly different. And there are many risk factors for fracture in addition to T-score, especially age and prior fracture. So these are the three ways that we diagnose osteoporosis when the T-score is minus 2.5 or below at the lumbar spine, total hip or femoral neck. When there's been a fragility of fracture, uh, NAMS says vertebral fracture or hip fracture, regardless of BMT and risk factors. And NAMS also says that um, we can diagnose osteoporosis when the T-score is between minus one and minus 2.5. And there's been a fracture of the humerus, pelvis, or forearm, or multiple fractures at other sites, uh, excluding face, feet, and hands, or high fracture probability by FRAX. And in the uh, US, uh, that's defined as major osteoporotic fracture uh, risk over 10 years, 20% or greater, or hip fracture risk 3% or greater. Having a, a fracture is uh, not only a sentinel event in a patient's life, uh, it uh, indicates an urgency to evaluate and treat. And this has a, a label now, it's called eminent uh, fracture risk. And that is a recognition that fracture risk is very high in the first one to two years uh, after having a fracture. And it remains high afterwards, but not as high as it is uh, initially. So uh, here you see one of a number of studies illustrating this. Uh, here we see that the risk of major osteoporotic fracture in the five years after hip, shoulder, or clinical vertebral fracture uh, is very high in the first one to two years or so. So evaluation and treatment is urgent to soon after a fracture. And Fracture Liaison Services, or FLS, is a strategy to systematically identify fracture patients, usually in the hospital setting, uh, enter them into a registry and track their progress after hospital discharge to assume that they're evaluated and treated appropriately. We have fracture risk algorithms that can estimate fracture risk uh, FRAX is the one that's most widely used uh, worldwide. Uh, it has many benefits. Uh, it gives us a quantitative uh, estimation of fracture risk. There are robust supporting data. It's part of DEXA software. Uh, there's a smartphone app for this, and uh, FRAX is included in many 
clinical practice guidelines. Uh, however, not all risk factors are included in PRAX. Uh, there's a dichotomous input, that is, we answer yes or no to risk factors, even though there may be a range of risk associated with the duration or severity of exposure. It has a range of error that's not very well defined. Uh, the only bone density input, if we have one, is femoral neck, uh, BMD. And in the US, we're limited to four uh, ethnicities. And if somebody is a, a mix of ethnicities or unknown ethnicity, we have to guess about uh, uh, the right way to do this. So FRAX is, is helpful, but uh, it's not uh, the final word on uh, what we ought to do in managing the patient. Before starting treatment, it's important to uh, consider uh, risk factors, that is um, uh, medications and conditions that have adverse skeletal effects. Certainly uh, for this audience, I think aromatase inhibitors is uh, an important risk factor for uh, bone loss and fracture, uh, but there's many other medications. Uh, Long-term glucocorticoids is especially uh, important uh, because of its adverse skeletal effects. There are genetic disorders, uh, endocrine diseases, uh, hyperthyroidism, for example, whether it be endogenous or from excess thyroid replacement, uh, eating disorders, vitamin D deficiency, uh, other nutritional deficiencies, uh, and on and on. So I don't have time to go through the whole list, but we need to recognize uh, that these factors can be important and those that are modifiable uh, ought to be addressed and uh, modified uh, if it's clinically appropriate. Uh, baseline laboratory tests uh, are important. Uh, NAMS uh, recognizes that uh, there are some routine tests that should probably be done in everyone. That begins with a complete blood count, uh, which may be abnormal in situations such as myeloma or celiac disease. Serum calcium, albumin, and phosphate uh, should be measured. In the US, we have a comprehensive metabolic panel that includes uh, all of those, except usually not a phosphate. So if a phosphate is not included in a blood chemistry panel, you need to think about that and order that separately. And uh, an abnormal phosphate that may be present uh, uh, in the case of renal failure where it's too high, and it may be low in cases of uh, hyperparathyroidism or renal uh, phosphate wasting. And it's important uh, to identify that early on before we start treatment. Um, many people would routinely do a, a serum 25 hydroxy vitamin D level as well. Uh, do not order the 125 uh, dihydroxy vitamin D as that is not as good an indicator of uh, body stores of vitamin D. And in some cases, serum PTH, uh, I uh, often order a 24 hour urinary calcium as a screening test for hypocalciuria, which may be an indicator of calcium malabsorption or hypercalciuria, uh, which can go along with other disorders that are important for bone health. And especially in older patients, consider uh, myeloma and uh, order uh, some such screening test as a serum protein electrophoresis. Uh, in some cases, uh, tryptase is screening test for mast cell disease or uh, TSH, especially if you suspect a, a thyroid disorder. These are indications for pharmacological therapy. Uh, uh, in NAMS uh, suggests uh, we consider these for prevention of bone loss uh, or for treatment of osteoporosis. So in the prevention side, which often gets uh, forgotten in uh, some of the other guidelines, uh, consider treatment when there's premature menopause, at least until the natural age of menopause, when the T-score is less than minus 1.0 when there's rapid bone loss due to menopause transition or discontinuing estrogen, and when t -score scores less than minus one and other risk factors are present. And for treatment of osteoporosis, if there's been a vertebral or hip fracture, if the T-score is minus 2.5 or below, or if the T-score is between minus one 
and minus 2.5 and one of the um, sub bullet uh, risk factors are present to consider pharmacological therapy to reduce fracture risk. For those of you that uh, may have a, a special uh, interest in osteoporosis and uh, want to learn more, or if you want to share your knowledge about osteoporosis uh, with others, or if you have cases about osteoporosis and metabolic bone diseases that you'd like to present and get other opinions, there is something called uh, bone health uh, echo. Uh, this has uh, been called a uh, virtual community of practice. Um, the uh, original bone health uh, echo was started at University of New Mexico in Albuquerque in 2015 and sessions have been held uh, once a week uh, since 2015, where we have brief uh, slide presentations followed by interactive discussion and case presentations followed by a discussion where everybody has a chance to ask their questions and, and make uh, comments. And this gives you an indication of the reach within the United States. And uh, beyond that, we've had uh, people from uh, every continent uh, participate at one time or another. Uh, since the uh, original uh, prototype uh, Project ECHO at uh, University of New Mexico, there's been eight other bone echo programs started up, uh, most of them in the U.S., but uh, five programs outside of the U.S., uh, including uh, Ireland, uh, two in Russia, Sydney, uh, um, Australia, combined with New Zealand, and one based in Beirut, uh, Lebanon. All of them are different days of the week, different times, sometimes different languages. It's a great opportunity to uh, uh, get more involved with osteoporosis if you wish. So to summarize, uh, BMD testing is indicated for all women uh, age 65 and older and younger postmenopausal women with risk factors. Osteoporosis may be diagnosed according to T-score uh, prior fracture or uh, at least in some cases, by high fracture probability. Postmenopausal women at risk for bone loss and those with high fracture risk should be considered for pharmacological therapy. Before starting pharmacological therapy, uh, evaluating for contributing factors should be uh, performed. And for anyone who wants more information about Bone Health Echo, uh, feel free to contact me at the email address you see here. And if you can't remember that, uh, just Google uh, bone and echo, and you'll get uh, uh, lots of links for more uh, information. So I'd like to thank you for your uh, attention. I look forward to Mike McClung's talk and uh, uh, Q&A to follow. Absolutely. Thanks so, so much for the presentation. We're going to hold uh, questions for now. Feel free to put your questions in the Q&A uh, box, and we will move on to Professor McClung. All right, thank you, Peter, and uh, good day to everyone. I'm also very pleased to be a part of, of this program. Uh, my friend and colleague, Dr. Lewicki, has uh, set up the, the stage to talk about uh, current therapeutic options. And uh, please, on this slide, note my uh, disclosures and financial relationships, uh, most pertinently uh, with Amgen. So as, as already has been mentioned, osteoporosis is a chronic incurable condition that consists of two components, not only low bone mass, but also because, uh, uh, and as a result of the bone loss that occurs, there is a deterioration in trabecular structure, weakening the skeleton and increasing fracture risk. While general measures such as adequate nutrition, regular physical activity and avoiding harmful lifestyle habits are important, those general measures are not sufficient to either prevent or certainly not to treat osteoporosis once present. For patients deemed to be at high fracture risk, then the strategy for reducing fracture risk involves the use of pharmacologic therapy. Over the past 25 years, a whole menu of treatment options has been developed. These drugs have different mechanisms of action, different contraindications, different side effects, and different potencies. And so selecting among the various treatment options uh, is one of the arts of managing patients uh, with osteoporosis. Some important pearls about osteoporosis treatment. 
like virtually every drug, uh, the, the, uh, the benefits of treatment uh, disappear uh, sometimes very quickly when therapy is stopped. So there is no short-term solution to treating osteoporosis because whatever benefits happen while on therapy quickly disappear when treatment is discontinued. The optimal management of a, a, a postmenopausal woman with osteoporosis over her lifetime will likely use, uh, include the use of multiple drugs in various sequences over that time. And with that in mind, it's important to understand where different drugs might fit in sequences and to develop a strategy for long-term treatment, uh, even at the outset of therapy. The uh, sequence with which drugs are given, as we'll talk about, may have very important clinical ramifications. So the drugs available for osteoporosis come in two major categories. They are anti-remodeling, often called anti-resorptive drugs that include the drugs we're most familiar with, including estrogen, estrogen agonists, bisphosphonates, and denosumab, the rank ligand inhibitor. These drugs not only inhibit bone resorption, their major mechanism of action, but they also inhibit bone formation. And as a consequence, these drugs cannot and do not restore the architectural deficit that characterizes osteoporosis. The other category includes bone forming or osteoanabolic drugs. Uh, there, this includes parathyroid hormone receptor activators, teriparatide, and in our country, abaloparatide, that increase both bone formation and bone resorption. And then in addition, there is a, an anti-sclerostin drug, romazosumab, that has a dual mechanism of stimulating bone formation while simultaneously decreasing bone resorption. So let me then think about these drugs individually and where they might have their uh, most important role in managing patients with osteoporosis. The choice of the initial therapy is uh, th thought to be importantly determined and decided by the level of risk of the patient. Uh, for patients who are at low risk, that is women who don't yet have osteoporosis, uh, then hormone therapy or low dose bisphosphonate as an alternative uh, are approved for preventing osteoporosis. For women who do have postmenopausal osteoporosis, but who are at moderate risk and who are not at high risk for hip fracture, raloxifen has a role as we'll talk about. For patients thought to be at high risk for osteoporosis, that would include women who have osteoporosis by bone density criteria uh, and or a remote history of uh, fractures, then anti-remodeling agents, bisphosphonates and denosumab are typically recommended. And then for patients at very high risk, that would be include women characterized by a recent fracture, very low bone density or very high fracture probability by a tool such as FRAX, it's in those patients that the bone building drugs are typically recommended. So let me present four cases to exemplify the, the choice of drugs. The first is a healthy 52 year old woman who is recently menopausal with hot flashes. She's thin, which is an important risk factor for having low bone density. And she has a family history of osteoporosis. She has not personally had a fracture and does not have other risk factors for osteoporosis. She is a candidate for DEXA testing by virtue of her thinness and her family history. And those results show low bone density. They are not in the osteoporosis range. She is currently at low fracture risk. However, because she is poised to, uh, uh, on the brink of a phase of relatively rapid bone loss, she is a candidate for therapy to prevent that rapid bone loss with estrogen or as a second choice, uh, one of the bisphosphonates. There is, as all of you who manage menopausal women know, a phase of relatively rapid bone loss that occurs for an interval of five to seven years over the menopausal transition. In the SWAN study and other studies, it's shown that the average loss of bone density over that menopausal transition is somewhere in the range of 10 to 12%. That's a T-score unit of bone density. 
During that phase of rapid bone loss, the architectural destruction is particularly devastating. The damage to the trabecular architecture is greater uh, in individuals with rapid bone loss compared to those who experience the same amount of bone loss, but over a much longer time period. And the uh, iliac crest biopsy uh, images shown here show a deterioration in bone architecture in a patient who was in a placebo group. Uh, this was a young menopausal woman enrolled in a clinical trial with obvious deterioration in her trabecular architecture over only a year's time. And the ability of anti-remodeling drugs like uh, bisphosphonates or estrogen to prevent that deterioration. So in the, uh, as another evidence of architectural deterioration, in the five years before through five years after the final menstrual period, the uh, measurement of spinal trabecular bone score, an indirect measure of trabecular architecture, declines by about 6.3%. Once that deterioration in structure has happened, drugs like estrogen and bisphosphonates do not uh, restore that disordered architecture. Estrogen, uh, uh, raloxifen, and bisphosphonates have government approval for osteoporosis prevention. Uh, and candidates for uh, therapy have already been outlined by Dr. Lewicki, including women with low bone density who are about to experience a rapid bone loss uh, in early menopause or who discontinue estrogen. So we know that estrogen with or without progestin or basidoxepin are effective in preventing the bone loss as for as long as the estrogen is taken. In the Women's Health Initiative, which was not specifically designed to be an osteoporosis study, women who were enrolled were uh, in their, on average in their early 60s, they were not selected to have osteoporosis. And in those low risk patients, there was clear evidence of fracture protection uh, at, uh, over the uh, five or six years of estrogen therapy. Fracture risk was also reduced with estrogen in the older Danish osteoporosis study uh, published many years ago. However, as stated earlier, the skeletal benefits of estrogen on both bone density and fracture protection are quickly lost when estrogen is discontinued. We know that we can prevent that loss uh, with uh, uh, bisphosphonate therapy. And so shown in this slide, in the left-hand panel, are results of spinal bone density changes in women who received estrogen progestin for four years with an increase in bone density of about 6%, while the placebo group was experiencing bone loss in these early uh, postmenopausal women. Then after four years, estrogen was discontinued and all of the gain that had been realized was lost within the next uh, 12 months. And ultimately, within two or three years, the bone density in the women who had been on estrogen resembled uh, the bone density in women who never took estrogen. Shown in the right-hand panel are older data showing that if women discontinued estrogen and were randomly assigned to receive either alendronate or placebo, that the bone density was maintained. And in a study that Dr. Watson and I presented at NAMS a few years ago, uh, as women discontinued estrogen, they were randomly assigned to receive either alendronate or raloxifen. Uh, as was shown in the previous slide, alendronate prevented bone loss from happening in both the spine and the hip. Raloxifen was partially, but not totally effective. Not surprising since raloxifen is a weaker uh, estrogen agonist then, of course, is estrogen itself. Each of the four bisphosphonates that are available for osteoporosis treatment are also approved for osteoporosis prevention, but the doses of alendronate and zoledronate uh, approved for prevention are smaller than the doses that are used for osteoporosis treatment. So for women who are candidates for prevention therapy, but who cannot or will not take estrogen, bisphosphonates are an alternative. So it would be important to continue bisphosphonate therapy during the interval of relatively rapid bone loss. And if prevention of bone loss is successful, then after that phase of rapid bone loss has been completed, the bisphosphonate could be discontinued 
the patient monitored and then treatment restarted if or when evidence of bone loss uh, was observed. There are other estrogen agonists uh, that include tibolone, available in uh, many countries. Uh, uh, this drug appears to be equipotent with estrogen and could be used interchangeably with hormone therapy for its uh, skeletal benefits. Raloxifen, again, a weaker estrogen agonist, as I mentioned, is not capable of fully preventing the bone loss in early menopause, uh, and it may increase the frequency and severity of vasomotor symptoms, so is typically not the ideal choice for preventing bone loss in early menopause. In studies in women with osteoporosis, raloxifen reduces vertebral fracture, but has minimal or no effect on non-vertebral, including hip fracture, and has an estrogen-like uh, risk of venous thrombosis. So its role in the management of patients with osteoporosis would be to treat younger postmenopausal women who are beyond the rapid phase of bone loss and who no longer experience vasomotor symptoms uh, uh, and who are not yet at high risk for hip fracture, particularly in women who have concerns about breast cancer risk because of that added benefit of raloxifen. So an example of where raloxifen might be used is this case, a healthy 58 year old woman who's 10 years beyond menopause and no longer has vasomotor symptoms because of a family history of osteoporosis, a DEXA test was performed. She has bone density values that meet the criteria for osteoporosis. She's not had a history of fracture, has no other risk factors for fracture nor risk factors for venous thrombosis. So she meets the criteria for therapy and in my view, would be a candidate for raloxifen, which could be continued until her risk for hip fracture increases by virtue of increasing age to the point that a, uh, a therapy that specifically uh, prevents hip fracture uh, would be warranted. The third case would be a 65 year old woman who had her uh, first DEXA test revealing osteoporosis with values in both the spine and the hip meeting that criteria. She had a risk fracture uh, eight years ago, but no other risk factors. She has normal renal function and no gastrointestinal symptoms to preclude the use of bisphosphonates. She meets the criteria, as Dr. Lewicki outlined, for being at high risk of fracture and then is a candidate for either a bisphosphonate or denosumab. The bisphosphonates come in both oral and IV preparations. They have been very effective in reducing the risks of vertebral, nonverbal, and hip fracture. There are very important dosing rules, as you know, for oral bisphosphonate therapy, GI distress, muscle pain, and rare instance of osteonecrosis of the jaw are important adverse events. Importantly, there is no additional benefit of bisphosphonate therapy beyond five years. I'll show you that in a moment, but therapy beyond five years is associated with a, an increasing risk of atypical fracture with the risk being approximately one in a thousand patients after eight to 10 years of bisphosphonate therapy. Shown in the upper panel uh, are hip bone density changes over nine years therapy with zoledronate showing uh, the, the typical increase that we see during the first few years and then a plateau after four to five years. This is seen in all of the long-term osteoporosis studies. Shown in the lower panel is the age-adjusted risk of atypical fracture as a function of duration of therapy with very low risk during the first few years of therapy. And then beyond five years, the risk increases uh, quite uh, substantially. Uh, those uh, situations led to the consideration of the so-called drug holiday. Uh, that we can take advantage of the relatively slow offset uh, fracture protection upon stopping a bisphosphonate uh, for, and we can consider temporary interruption of therapy uh, after three to five years in patients who at that point are at low fracture risk. So after three to five years of bisphosphonate therapy, treatment could be temporarily stopped if the patient no longer meets the criteria for therapy. Then, the patient should be monitored uh, with bone density and clinical history every year or two, and therapy should be restarted uh, 
when the patient again meets the uh, criteria uh, for being on therapy. For patients who remain at high fracture risk after three to five years of bisphosphonate therapy, continuing treatment is important. But for based on what I said on the previous slide, I feel there's no justification for continuing bisphosphonates for more than five years at a time in any individual patients. So for those patients who remain at high risk after three to five years of therapy, I would consider switching to another drug like denosumab or a bone building drug. Shown here are the results of uh, hip bone density changes over 10 years of denosumab therapy shown in the top panel with a progressive increase over that full 10 years time. And shown in the lower panel are the results of four separate studies in which patients who have been on bisphosphonates were transitioned to denosumab. And in each case, there was an additional improvement in hip bone density in those who switched from a bisphosphonate to a denosumab. So denosumab is a fully human monoclonal anti-rank ligand antibody that is administered subcutaneously every six months. In a very large uh, placebo-controlled trial, fracture risk reduction uh, was documented with the uh, risk reductions noted there. As I've mentioned, there is a progressive improvement in bone density over at least 10 years and evidence that there is additional non-vertebral fracture protection uh, with longer-term treatment. There is no limit to the duration of therapy. The clinical trial experience extends out to 10 years and there was no duration-dependent uh, increased risk of any adverse event over that 10 years time. Like estrogen, there is a very rapid offset of the skeletal benefits, including a protection from vertebral fracture when treatment is discontinued. So if for whatever reason treatment is stopped, then follow on therapy with uh, intravenous uh, IV zoledronate and careful monitoring uh, to consider a second dose of zoledronate uh, is important to minimize the rebound in bone remodeling and the rapid bone loss that occurs when denosumab is discontinued. The uh, safety concerns with denosumab included skin rash and cellulitis that happen more frequently uh, with therapy compared to placebo, but in the long-term follow-up of patients over 10 years, those risks did not increase and no other new risks were developed. Uh, rare cases of osteonecrosis of the jaw and atypical fracture have been reported with denosumab. The third case uh, then uh, that we mentioned, the lady who was a candidate for a bisphosphonate or denosumab, if bisphosphonates are chosen, then her risk should be reevaluated after three to five years to determine the next step in her management. If denosumab is uh, chosen, then therapy can be continued long-term, but if discontinued, we need to take steps to prevent the rapid loss of bone density uh, in that situation. And the last case is a patient who meets the criteria for being at very high risk of fracture. She's a 71 year old woman who had a humerus fracture several years ago and recently experienced two vertebral fractures while gardening. The recency of a fracture is by far the strongest risk factor for having another fracture and patients with recent fractures uh, meet the criteria for being at very high risk. Her workup for secondary causes was negative. Her lumbar spine bone density value is quite low. And as a consequence of that history and bone density value, she is deemed to be at very high risk of fracture and is a candidate for a bone building drug to be followed by an anti-remodeling drug. The PTH receptor analogs, teriparatide and abaloparatide, are given by daily subcutaneous injection for 18 to 24 months. The, the limit uh, for therapy is driven mainly because the bone building effects of all of the bone building drugs gradually diminishes over time. And so that's why the duration of therapy is limited to uh, 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 a year or two. Uh, 
in clinical trials, both of these drugs uh, result in substantial reduction in vertebral fracture risk and evidence of non-vertebral fracture risk reduction, but no direct evidence for hip fracture uh, risk reduction. The adverse events include hypercalcemia, an extension of how these drugs work, and orthostatic hypotension at the beginning of therapy. Uh, these drugs are not to be used in patients who are at risk for osteosarcoma. Romosozumab is the other bone building drug, an anti-sclerostin antibody. Sclerostin is an endogenous inhibitor of bone formation and by inhibiting the action of that protein, then bone formation is activated while resorption is inhibited. Romosozumab is given by monthly subcutaneous injections over an interval of 12 months. Uh, fracture risk reduction in studies was demonstrated after 12 months, there was a 73% reduction in vertebral fracture risk compared to placebo and a 37% reduction compared to alendronate. And in patients who received romosozumab for 12 months followed by alendronate, there were significant reductions in non-vertebral fracture and hip fracture compared with women who took alendronate uh, through the entire treatment interval. The adverse reactions include in injection site reactions, typically mild, and possible cardiovascular risk. In studies comparing romosozumab to alendronate, uh, there were more cardiac events in the uh, romosozumab arm. Uh, we did not see a cardiovascular signal when romosozumab was compared to placebo. Because of that, romosozumab should not be used in patients who are at very high risk for cardiovascular events. Studies have shown that these bone building drugs are more effective in improving bone density and in reducing fracture risk compared to bisphosphonates. Like other drugs, when these bone building drugs are stopped, the benefit goes away quite quickly. And it's important that the patients be transitioned to either a bisphosphonate or tadanosumab to maintain the skeletal benefits. When that's done, we know that both bone density and fracture protection persist for at least two years after transition to the anti-remodeling drug. We also know that the bone density responses to therapy are smaller in patients who are previously treated with other drugs compared to treatment naive drugs. So in theory, these bone building drugs would be the ideal initial therapy for all patients with osteoporosis who have experienced the architectural disruption, but they are currently recommended uh, for use in patients at very high risk of fracture. There's some patients for whom there's special considerations. For patients with renal insufficiency, we use bisphosphonates with great caution. For the very elderly, it's important to note that no one is ever too old to treat. The fracture protection from therapy is noted within months of beginning treatment but we often consider parenteral therapies like zoledronate or denosumab in patients who have many other drugs uh, that are taking for other reasons. And for patients with other confounding medical issues, as Dr. Lewicki emphasized, we need to individualize therapy. So to summarize, again, osteoporosis requires lifelong management. There is no short-term fix for osteoporosis. The choice of initial therapy should be individualized and guided by the patient's fracture risk. The optimal management will involve the sequential use of different classes of osteoporosis drugs in a whole variety of different sequences, uh, the, at the end of which the final drug in almost any sequence would likely be zoledronate, where we can take advantage of its long duration of action after a single intravenous dose. We need to remember that the skeletal benefits of all drugs wane when treatment is stopped. That requires then long-term management, uh, with often with multiple drugs over a patient's lifetime. And perhaps the most important treatment that we can offer women in early menopause uh, is hormone therapy at the time of menopause to prevent that rapid bone loss and the rapid deterioration in trabecular architecture uh, to minimize their risk of developing osteoporosis and fractures in the future. With that, I thank you for your attention and again, look forward to the question and answer period.
Thank you again so much, uh, both Professors Lewicki and, and McClung for two wonderful presentations. We do have a, a number of questions here, so we will um, start out. Uh, this first one um, has to do with uh, the value of repeating DEXA scan in patients who are already osteoporotic. Uh, Dr. Lewicki, do you wanna tackle that one? Well, there's different reasons for repeating a, a bone density test. And uh, as with any test, it uh, should not be done at all unless uh, it's likely to influence your patient management decisions. Uh, the question usually comes up in a patient who's been started on treatment. And uh, it's recommended by most guidelines that uh, a follow-up DEXA study be done one to two years later. Uh, I like more information rather than less, so I typically will do a bone density test one year later, and I at least like to see stability and better yet, an, an increase in bone density. Uh, now, I also have a lot of patients who have osteoporosis and are at high risk for fracture, but do not want to have pharmacological therapy. And um, often, even though they don't want to be treated at this time, they're interested in following up to see if their non-pharmacological therapy is working or not. And again, I often have those patients come back a year later, do a repeat bone density test, and have a conversation with the patient. Is uh, calcium, vitamin D, and exercise working, or are you losing bone density in spite of doing that? And then we'll have another conversation about uh, pharmacological therapy. And uh, sometimes at that point, the patient is willing to be treated and sometimes not, but uh, that's all part of shared decision-making. Great. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And, and again, if we're thinking about sequences of therapy, the reason to measure bone density in patients who, with osteoporosis on treatment is to figure out what the next step in therapy is. So uh, there, there's, uh, there's important value in, in monitoring response to therapy. It's important to appreciate that on treatment bone density has been shown to correlate with current fracture risk and so is an important uh, outcome to monitor and track while we treat patients. I think this next one uh, is along the treatment line. Uh, Professor McClung, there's a question here on the role of recombinant PTH post parathyroidectomy for primary and tertiary hyperparathyroidism to prevent osteoporosis. Yep, that's uh, well beyond uh, the, the scope of, of these presentations. After parathyroidectomy, uh, then uh, the patient is no longer at risk for the bone loss that happens because of elevated PTH. So recombinant PTH therapy after parathyroidectomy is indicated if the patient develops hypoparathyroidism as a hormone replacement therapy, essentially, so. Let's see. Yeah, and, and of course, if, if you've had a, a parathyroidectomy and uh, a couple of years later, it's determined that you're at very high risk for fracture, certainly you could consider any of the anabolic agents at that point, including sure. the PTH receptor agonist. Next one has to do with um, use of hormonal therapy. Um, the question is in the case of a woman, early menopause, 38 years old and no hormonal therapy offered. She's now 59 and has osteoporosis. Can hormonal therapy offer protection to prevent further decline in bone density if, and the individual has good BMI and lifestyle? And I would, uh, before you tackle the, the use of osteoporosis, just point out that you know, from a safety standpoint, um, she's certainly younger than age 60 and appears to be healthy, um, even in patients uh, over, you know, if you look at the WHI in the original cohort of 50 to 80 year old patients, the risk in estrogen only was very low. So there are ways nowadays with uh, spacing out progestogen or using an IUD so that you don't get the systemic progestogen of uh, minimizing the risk. Uh, so it can be used from a safety standpoint. How about from the uh, bone bone protection standpoint? All right. So estrogen uh, given to elderly women who have already well passed their phase of rapid bone loss does have a skeletal benefit. Uh, bone density increases. There are very few studies 
looking at the effect of estrogen therapy on fracture risk in women with osteoporosis. And that's why it doesn't have a government approval uh, as a treatment because studies evaluating its effect on fracture risk in patients with osteoporosis have simply not been done. Uh, it's no more advantageous than bisphosphonate. So in a patient who has, is many years into estrogen efficiency and has osteoporosis, uh, estrogen does not have government approval for that treatment, but would have skeletal benefit if for other reasons, estrogen were decided to be used. You know, I, I think there's a, a dose and an effect relationship with estrogen as, as with most drugs. And um, oftentimes um, women will get started on estrogen that may be sufficient to relieve menopausal symptoms or not cause any adverse effects and, and yet may not be sufficient uh, to provide skeletal protection. And uh, this is a, a case where doing some tests called bone turnover markers uh, might be helpful. They um, can represent the anti-resorptive effect that's being achieved uh, with estrogen or some other drug. So the one that's most commonly used and recommended is a fasting serum CTX or C-telopeptide. If you had a, a baseline value and then got a, a follow-up uh, test three to six months after starting estrogen, and it went down by at least 100. I think you could be happy that you're achieving an adequate anti-resorptive effect and hopefully some skeletal protection from the estrogen. And if there's less than a change of 100, uh, then the patient may need a higher dose of estrogen or perhaps uh, switch to a bisphosphonate at that point. Is a FRAC score of use without DEXA scan results, and if used as a guide with assessment of other risk or lifestyle factors? Uh, well, yes, it, it can be used uh, without femoral neck uh, BMD. And in fact, that's one of the main reasons that FRAX was developed in the first place. Uh, there are many regions of the world where DEXA is not available or not affordable. Uh, so doing FRAX without BMD can give you an estimation of uh, fracture risk. And uh, in some cases is sufficient to make treatment decisions. If uh, uh, fracture risk is very high, uh, that may be grounds for initiating pharmacological therapy and a fracture risk is very low, uh, then non-pharmacological therapy is appropriate. And if it's somewhere in the middle, uh, then that may be an extra good reason to go ahead and do a DEXA. And in fact, that's the way the European guidelines are generally formulated because DEXA is not as available as it is in the US. So FRAX uh, without uh, DEXA is often used as the initial evaluation for fracture risk. You know, they may be getting at here in the question, I'm kind of reading between the lines, but uh, the discussion of using it in the, the slightly younger patient who uh, you use it as a risk factor marker. So no DEXA result, but using the estimation of risk that would give you the risk of a 65 year old uh, to suggest um, DEXA testing, and maybe that's part of what they're getting at. Yeah, that, uh, that it could do that, but for women, uh, for younger postmenopausal women, particularly those in early menopause where rapid bone loss is about to be seen, FRAX will show a very low fracture risk and would uh, dissuade consideration for therapy, but I think you have to take into account the context uh, of rapid bone loss about to happen. And so I, I would not rely on FRAX to make decisions about uh, uh, initiating therapy for prevention. Uh, let's see, what is the risk of DEXA scan regarding radiation exposure? It, it, it's nil. Yeah, yeah it, it's a trivial amount of radiation. I, I, right. I live in a city that's about a mile high in altitude, and the amount of uh, ambient radiation uh, just from living at this altitude is about the same as the radiation from a, a standard DEXA study. So it's, it's very, very tiny. That helps to put in perspective. When, when I fly to Albuquerque for the Santa Fe Bone Symposium, I'm exposed to more radiation than a DEXA test would entail. <laughs> 
the prevalence of severe vitamin D deficiency or less than 20 in otherwise healthy women is concerning. At what age do you recommend a 20 hydroxy D testing as a routine test? Uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and take the first stab at that. I, I think from a, a public health um, viewpoint, it, it's not cost effective to uh, ever do a, a serum 25 hydroxy vitamin D as a screening test. Uh, however, uh, if there's reason to suspect that somebody's vitamin D deficient, or if you're thinking of starting treatment for osteoporosis, uh, I would like to have a vitamin D level on, on all of those patients. I would agree that the, the uh, severe consequences of uh, or important consequences of vitamin D deficiency really happen when patients have very severe uh, uh, deficiency with values less than 10 or 12 nanograms per mil. And so I, I agree with Mike that it's not uh, cost effective to do 25D level routine screening and the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force, again, doesn't recommend that. But for patients at risk for vitamin D deficiency, that would include uh, patients with severe renal impairment, patients with malabsorption or post-bariatric surgery, uh, or who take drugs like Dilantin that interfere with vitamin D metabolism, then uh, individualizing vitamin D supplements using 25D levels uh, is important. Next question uh, talks about a 65 year old uh, age and the use of DEXA and how frequently should DEXA be used? We, we question doesn't talk about what the result was. Um, I think based on the fact that you both talked how, how to use it in a patient that is osteoporotic or at risk uh, in terms of prevention, let's assume that the question is saying 65 year old normal result uh, greater than minus one what would you do? How frequently do you repeat that? And how do you, how do you, do you use a, a calculator to uh, use an age repeat time? Uh, yeah, uh, if, if a woman is 65 and is well past the rapid interval of bone loss, then if she's otherwise healthy uh, without important other medical problems, her rate of bone loss is very small. Uh, 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 a half a percent or a percent per year. So if she has a T-score of minus one, it will take her a very, very long time to get to the point where bone density would be uh, uh, consistent with an indication for therapy. So the closer someone is to your treatment threshold, then the more frequently uh, a follow-up uh, would be measured. But typically if someone uh, does not have osteoporosis at age 65, repeating the test within the next five years in the absence of other important clinical features probably isn't necessary. Yeah, well, let me just go on to mention some of those important clinical uh, features. Uh, so if you're 65 and you have a normal T-score, but you're being started on high dose uh, prednisone, or you're going to get an aromatase inhibitor for uh, breast cancer adjuvant therapy, uh, that's a whole different situation. And uh, those patients need to be monitored much more closely. What is the, <clears throat> excuse me, the importance of sarcopenia and its diagnosis and treatment in managing the postmenopausal woman and the avoidance of disability and osteoporosis? Well, certainly uh, muscle weakness and frailty is an important component of aging and uh, contributes to fracture risk by increasing fall risk. Uh, so that's a, a, a very important part of the, the generalized aging process. If we had a treatment for sarcopenia, that would be fantastic, but uh, we don't uh, yet have a specific therapy. But recognizing uh, fall risk is an important component of managing patients with osteoporosis and employing strategies uh, like exercise programs or uh, programs to improve balance, to improve home safety, to improve vision are all important components of managing elderly, frail patients with osteoporosis. You know, that brings up the idea of fall risk assessment in the office setting. And uh, every patient I see with osteoporosis, I evaluate their balance and muscle strength. I 
watch them walk across the exam room. I see how difficult it is for them to get out of the chair and onto the examination table. I asked them to do a one leg stand uh, in most cases and uh, being able to keep your balance standing on one leg for more than 10 seconds is a good indicator that uh, the risk of falling is not very high. If they can't hold a one leg stand for uh, at least six seconds, they're in a high risk category for falls and often I'll send those people to a physical therapy uh, place to uh, uh, work on core strength and balance. There's a question about the, the difference in the quality of bone formed with the different therapeutic options. Any comment on that? Well, there are differences between anti-remodeling drugs, which work by the, the, the increased bone density occurs because of filling in of the remodeling spaces that are open when treatment is started. That's different than the laying down of new bone uh, in response to the bone forming uh, agents, but the, uh, none of the drugs uh, substantially alter or uh, impair the quality of, of the bone that uh, 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 is accrued as a consequence of therapy. Yeah, you know, in, in clinical trials, uh, uh, transiliac bone biopsies are required exactly for that reason, to uh, evaluate the quality of bone. And if uh, poor quality bone were being formed by any medication, it would probably uh, not get governmental approval. Sure. You have a, a suggestion on the use of vitamin K2 supplementation and whether to, to use that in the menopause transition to, to maintain healthy bones? No, uh, none, none of those uh, supplements are, uh, are potent enough to prevent the loss of bone due to estrogen deficiency. Uh, estrogen, estrogen is a very important and strong regulator of bone metabolism and uh, 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 calcium, vitamin D, exercise, vitamin K, uh, none of those are uh, useful uh, or effective in preventing the bone loss that, that occurs as a consequence of estrogen deficiency. Uh, you know, I, I do not recommend vitamin K2 to anybody, but many patients come in and tell me they're taking it. Is that okay? And I say, if you want to take it, that's fine. It seems to be very safe, uh, but we do not have any strong evidence that it's beneficial. Right. There's a question about um, osteoporosis bone pain and uh, specifically about bisphosphonates, but I'd broaden that and, and ask, do you use any agents, calcitonin, uh, or any of the agents to help with um, osteoporosis pain? The only drug that's been suggested to be beneficial is the use of, of calcitonin after a vertebral fracture. Uh, first of all, bone pain is rarely a component of osteoporosis. If a patient has low bone density and bone pain, then I'm thinking about osteomalacia or other problems that need to be evaluated. But there's uh, no good evidence that any of our treatments uh, uh, reverses uh, uh, musculoskeletal pain in patients that already have osteoporosis. Terapeutide minimizes the development of pain because it, of course, prevents fractures from happening. You know, I, I, I think the, the only instance where you might think of osteoporosis causing bone pain is, is uh, when patients are having micro fractures uh, in the spine that haven't been recognized and, and yet uh, might be enough uh, to cause pain. And there are, are even situations where, uh, and I've seen this in a few of my patients, uh, uh, they've had back pain, the x-ray show no fracture. I've done an MRI and uh, there is a edema in vertebral bodies on the MRI. So even though there's no loss of vertebral height, uh, there are apparently micro fractures enough uh, to show up in the MRI and cause uh, bone pain. But, but these are very unusual situations. I'm gonna do maybe one or two more questions here. I'm gonna uh, combine a couple here. There's some questions about overlapping drugs, um, <clears throat> the use of uh, osteoanabolic uh, drugs with bisphosphonates, denos uh, denosinab with Romo, uh, 
comments on overlapping use of medications? Yeah, the, the combining therapy is not uh, particularly beneficial. The, the uh, combining bisphosphonates and teriparatide uh, has minimal advantage uh, and using them sequentially rather than in combination is, is better. Uh, nobody has combined uh, denosumab and romazosumab yet because romazosumab has an anti-resorptive effect, then the added benefit of more anti-resorption probably adds little uh, to that. So again, we, the data we have uh, document the tremendous efficacy using them sequentially, and I would stick with that rather than using them uh, uh, together. Uh, you know, the only potential uh, combination that might be uh, useful is uh, combining teriparatide and denosumab and um, in, in some extremely high risk patients that's something that might be uh, considered uh, for example in a patient who's been on denosumab and continuing to have fractures and is at very high risk rather than switching to teriparatide there might be an advantage to adding teriparatide to denosumab right. but again these are rare situations I don't know if there's any question in there either of you saw that that you want to tackle as the final one. Otherwise, I'll give us one more and then we'll wrap it up. Or any just I'll, final final thoughts or comments. I'll leave it leave it to you. <laughs> well, there's one one here about um, uh, considering in postmenopausal women with rapid decrease in BMD, uh, uh, and that basically by age 65 they've already gone through that. So shouldn't DEXA be performed at the time of menopause uh, and, and when when they're earlier in that rapid decline phase? Sure. And, and Dr. Lewicki outlined that. So the indications for DEXA are at age 65 or younger postmenopausal women with risk factors for osteoporosis, including being thin or a family history or having had a fracture. So uh, we don't we don't have to wait until age 65 to do bone density. If there's concern about the potential risk of osteoporosis, it ought to be done at the time of menopause so that we can take advantage of, <laughs> of the strategies to prevent that rapid interval of bone loss. Right. You know, if I, if I were king of the world, I would do a DEXA yeah. on every postmenopausal woman, whether at she the time has, of menopause. has risk factors or not. Yeah, yeah. at the time sure. of menopause. Um, right. It's not cost effective from a public health standpoint, probably, but it may be very effective for individual patients uh, who turn out to uh, have very low bone density. But we would recommend that for our wives and daughters. Right. <laughs> well, I want to thank you both. There, there's a ton of questions. We could probably go on all day here, and it's just a reflection of the wonderful presentations that you've both given, and I really uh, appreciated uh, both of you taking the time and chance to see you virtually here again. Hopefully, we'll, we'll be together live uh, soon at, at one of the meetings, but thank you both. Um, there's some questions about the presentation. All of our um, IMS presentation, the symposiums, are recorded. Uh, there'll be some information uh, for you about that in terms of being able to watch this presentation again and look out for upcoming symposiums that we have going monthly um, with the IMS. So thank you very much for attending and uh, hope to see you all again soon. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you.